Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming along. Scott's not the only one who's been looking forward to this talk. I have been looking forward to give the, giving this talk, and I've been sort of working toward giving this talk over a couple of times over this year. What I want to do is I want to give you a real tour of the past, the present, and the future of virtual reality. And I want to show you how the story of virtual reality is bound up intimately with the other great transformation in technology in our lifetime. And I think that'll become clear as I weave the story threads. We're going to start not in 1990, which is where I enter the story, but we're actually going to start in 1968 with this gentleman, Ivan Sutherland. Now, Ivan Sutherland invented what we would think of as most of interactive computing in the early 1960s, but that wasn't good enough for him. And so by 1968, he had to invent something that he called the ultimate display. That is the first instance of a head-mounted display. It had to use mirrors because you only had cathode ray tubes back then, and so they had to be mounted somewhere else, and the images had to be reflected into your eyes. And because head tracking technology in 1968 was entirely mechanical, there was an apparatus that actually tracked you in the room physically as you moved, so that this piece was called the Sword of Damocles because it hung above you as you moved. So this is 1968, but all of the basic elements for what we would think of as modern virtual reality are there. Now, a few months after Sutherland does this, and it'll be 48 years ago this coming Friday, something else happened. It's something that is known today, and here's a very simple invitation to the event. It's known today as the mother of all demos. If you've ever seen Steve Jobs do an amazing demo or anyone else do an amazing demo of technology product, every one of them has its roots back in this one event on Monday afternoon, December the 9th in 1968 at the Fall Joint Computer Conference where this man, Dr. Douglas Engelbart, demonstrated some stuff he'd sort of been working on in the lab. Let me give you some idea of what he invented. Well, the first thing that he invented was the first working hypertext system. Hypertext, linking things together on a computer. The web is a hypertext system. So all descended hypertext systems, including the web, begin in this moment. And because you had to be able to manipulate hypertext on screen, he invented the mouse to be able to manipulate the text on screen so that you could link everything together. Now, my feeling is that, in fact, in the 48 years since Douglas Engelbart, all we've been doing is commentary on this demo. All of computer science flows out of this. But what you can see is in 1968, what you have is virtual reality and the web in these embryonic forms being born at the same moment. And what we will see flowing through to this day and into the future is that they continue to weave back and forth with each other. All right, we come forward to 1985. So virtual reality, as we think of it, is still a little bit more than 30 years old. That's Scott Fisher. He was working at NASA Ames in California, developing systems that would allow space shuttle folks to be able to practice operations before they actually did them on flight. And so he invented a virtual reality system to be able to do that. And this has now all of what we would think of as the modern aspects of virtual reality, head tracking, displays, 3D sound, and the data glove, which was invented by them as well. So you could track a person's hands, just as you would with a controller on a modern VR system. This goes along for a couple more years, and most of that technology gets uh, privatized by a company called VPL. And the founder of VPL is a man named Jaron Lanier, who's thought by many to be one of the fathers of virtual reality. This was around the time I started hearing about virtual reality, and I read a very long interview with Jaron in a magazine called Mondo 2000. This was in December 1990, so 26 years ago, more or less this week. And there is one line in that interview that has stuck with me all of these years because that line marks a fundamental transformation point in my own understanding and in my own career. He said, look, it, VR is not the television of the future. VR is the telephone of the future. He was putting his marker down. He said, this is a medium for human communication. It is not really a medium about entertainment. Yes, you can use it for that, but it's about connecting people. 
It's about making things happen. And when I read that line, I kind of lost my mind because for the five years before that, I had been working in data communications. I had been working full time making these things. I found that picture this morning. I can't believe it exists. That's called a net modem. I was working at this company called Shiva Corporation. Shiva did something that no one had ever done before. They made a device that made it possible for you to dial into a network. Now that sounds like something that's pretty bog standard today because we all have slow broadband connections at home, but we have them. But at this point, the idea that you could have a network at work and dial in from home and access the file server and printer, oh my God, that was very exciting. But this was my daily work. And I was thinking, oh my goodness, we could make this, we could bring VR into the home. We could make consumer virtual reality systems and we could connect them so that people would be able to connect online and interact virtually. And so I quit my job and I started a company which I named Ono Sendai Corporation out of William Gibson's Neuromancer. It was chartered to be the networked consumer virtual reality company. It was the first consumer virtual reality company because at the time, virtual reality systems cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. We were trying to make it cost about $1,200, about the price of an expensive toy. And what we needed to do is we needed to think very carefully about how to bring all of the costs down in virtual reality. So we started that by working on the sensors. The most important sensor in a virtual reality system is the sensor that tracks the orientation of your head. So that when you're looking around in a virtual world, the image is following you in a one-to-one -one coordination and it's doing it nice and quick. And the systems to do that back in 1991 cost $50,000. What you're looking at is the patent that we had on our solution to that problem that cost $1. There were a lot of other problems that we had to solve on the way to consumer VR, and we got a little bit interrupted because another small company came along and said, we're working on consumer VR. That small company was Sega. And they were doing a project that they called the Virtua VR system. It was going to plug into the Sega Genesis, known as the Sega Master System here in Australia. It was going to run off the CD. There were going to be games on it. It was going to be networked. And they absolutely needed our sensor because it was one of the core things that would make a VR system cost not tens of thousands of dollars, but hundreds of dollars. And we prototyped the system with them. We prototyped the system. Hang on a minute, because I've forgotten. I have a prop. That's the prototype code. That's a Genesis cartridge. I still have this 26 years later. We prototyped the system and we showed it off at the Consumer Electronics Show in 1993. Now, what we showed off at the Consumer Electronics Show was essentially a miner's helmet that, with a lot of stuff gaffer taped onto it. But it was shown in the middle of the Sega booth and it was behind many walls of security. And as you got further and further into the Sega booth, the booth got darker and darker. And finally, you were in this dimly lit room and you'd have the buyer from Target in and the buyer from Walmart in and they'd put it on and they'd lose their minds. And then they would order several hundred thousand units for Christmas 1993. And it never shipped because it turned out that when they started to manufacture them and they started to give them to kids, the kids started to get sick because it turns out that it's actually really easy to make someone sick in VR, and it's really hard to give them a good experience when you're running on an eight megahertz microprocessor. <laughs> Which was not slow in 1993, but it wasn't speedy either. So my dreams of a consumer virtual reality system were in some sense drowned in 1993, but that didn't end my work in virtual reality because while I was working on the hardware, I was also working very hard on the software because Ono Sendai was a networked virtual reality company. And so part of my work was to understand what would happen when you would have hundreds of thousands of people inhabiting cyberspace at the same time. And the thing that I realized was there's going to need to be a system, a protocol to be able to arbitrate who owns what area of space. Because if you have a metaverse, someone's going to be able to say, that's my property and that's your property and you can have fun over there and I can have fun over here. And I wrote all of that up with this fellow. That's Tony Parisi. He moved to San Francisco just about this moment in time. This is us taken this year because we're still quite good friends. 
And it became a very, very productive relationship because I took the work that I'd been doing in networking and said to my friend Tony, hey, have you heard of this crazy new thing called the web? It's a hypertext system. And I think I can take my work in virtual reality and apply it to that. He said, okay, let's try it. And so we sat down and we wrote some code over a month. And in February 1994, we got the Cyber Banana. This is the first web VRML-based image. It's a banana because I don't know how to model. I still don't know how to model, but I had a pre-built model of a banana. And if you want to see it, there's the URL. So we got the banana up and running. And I, I then realized that, in fact, the folks in the web world are very interested in virtual reality. And there's an open call for anyone who's been doing work on the web and VR. And I write back. And I get an invitation to present a paper at a little conference that they're having. And so I write up that paper. There is the paper. Paper, the last. So it talks about this protocol, which I called cyberspace protocol. And it talks about using this thing called a virtual reality modeling language as a way to be able to show that the protocol is working. It's just a visualization layer. It's just a little bit of icing on the top to show that you can actually share all of this space among tens or hundreds of thousands of people. But what happens is everyone goes, oh my god, you've got virtual reality on the web. And VRML becomes a huge thing. And this guy who asked me to write a little paper and go to his conference turns out to be Tim Berners-Lee, the father of the web. And we're off and running. And now virtual reality has got this weird second life because of the web. Because most of the rest of the VR world had started to die off. It had sued itself in ex out of existence because people would have wars with patents, or the systems were simply too expensive, or the use cases were too weird. Well, let's talk about some of those use cases. I want to give you two examples of the kind of virtual reality we were doing 20, 25 years ago. The most beautiful example I know of is something called the nano manipulator. The nano manipulator is a VR system that is connected to a scanning, tunneling electron microscope. Now, an atomic force microscope, or STM, is essentially a really, really, really sharp pin, I'm not making this up, running in a vacuum. And what happens is, like a television beam, it scans across a surface. As it scans across a surface, it can tell you where the atoms are. And it was connected to a VR system so that it could actually draw those atoms. And it was connected to a controller so that you could run your hand across the surface of the atoms. That's fine for you and I, but actually when you give that to a chemist, the chemist starts to understand things about material science that they could not understand even when they could see a photomicrograph of the atomic structure. So you have this relationship now between the data that's being presented and the interaction with that data that is helping people learn things. This is a many hundred thousand dollar system. It was a research project. It was a beautiful thing, but of course it didn't really go far beyond that. Another project that was incredible is called the Virtual NYSE. So you could take all of the information that was being thrown at a trader through a Bloomberg terminal, which back at the time was just walls and walls and walls of text, and create a big virtual environment. And they found that when you did this, the trader would be able to absorb information approximately 5,000 times faster than they could if they were using a Bloomberg terminal. I've created a little chart to show you what that actually looks like in practice. <laughs> These were the promises for virtual reality. But again, that system required about a half a million dollars of computing. So even if you were a bond trader, that's probably a big ask. And so virtual reality kind of runs out of steam. At least it looks that way. And we go into what we would call the empty quarter. There's about 20 years where there's very little virtual reality taking place. But there are two things that are happening all along that are keeping the flame alive. One of them is the video game console. Because no sooner does VR sort of fall over than the PlayStation is released. Now, you have to remember, before the PlayStation, no one had ever seen real-time 3D computer graphics, certainly not in the home. 
Real-time 3D computer graphics are now completely commonplace. We have them everywhere in the world, and they start here. When we were doing all our work in VR, Real-time 3D computer graphics required a supercomputer. Well, this is what happened to that supercomputer, and we're now in something like the fourth generation with the PlayStation 4. So that's one thing that happened. Then that happened. Now, that's Steve Jobs. That is almost 10 years ago. It'll be 10 years ago on the 7th of January that the iPhone is introduced. And I've spent a lot of time analyzing this keynote, and he's going through all the features. There's only two minutes of that entire demonstration that actually matter, and it's the two minutes when he shows mobile Safari. Because the reason everyone in this room has a smartphone now is because you now have the web with you wherever you go. So you have access to the entire informational resource that we have spent the last 20 years collaboratively building, and you have that all of the time everywhere. Remember how I said there are threads and they weave? And there's been this interesting feedback between graphics technology and smartphone technology and Moore's Law. And it looks something like this. So if you want to think about that 20-year period, that's what Moore's Law looks like when you chart it over 20 years. But that's what Moore's Law looks like when you chart it out over how Tomb Raider looks. The systems that we have today are a thousand times faster than the systems that we were using when we were doing our work in virtual reality. A thousand times more powerful. And the penny drop moment for virtual reality was this one. Because all of a sudden, Two engineers at Google walked up on stage and said, hi, we've got $2 in cardboard and lenses, and we've just turned every smartphone in the world into a virtual reality system. You know, this is when the modern age of virtual reality begins, because this is when we all collectively found out that all of us already had VR. So now it becomes not a question of whether we're going to get VR. It's now about what we're going to do with it. But let's just sort of talk about what the landscape looks like right now. So sort of this is the timeline. There's more than 10 million cardboards out there. Really, no one knows how many, but there's, there's more than 10 million. There's about two and a half million of the Gear VRs, which is kind of a fancy version of a cardboard. Uh, probably 10,000 HoloLenses. They're still quite expensive. It's an augmented reality system, so it mixes the real world. I think this is where things are eventually converging. We have the Oculus Rift, which shipped at least in part back in April and is actually only shipping in the rest of its parts on Tuesday, which has been a bit of a problem for them. There's the Vive, and yes, big shout out to the Vive. I love a Vive, I have a Vive. It's an amazing system, I think, for professional class VR. That's the system people want. And then, 25 years after I tried to make it happen, on the 13th of October, I was able to go into JB Hi-Fi and pick up my PlayStation VR, and I now have a high-end, room scale virtual reality system that is also a consumer toy. So that for about $1,000 now, people can have very high quality <laughs> virtual reality experiences. And they've sold about three quarters of a million of them so far. And of course, just on the heels of that is the Daydream VR. And remember what I said, this is sort of the full circle because if the cardboard is the beginning of that penny drop about every smartphone being a VR system. Well, the daydream is the completion of that promise. But there's another level here. We have been manufacturing smartphones for 10 years. That means that we have manufactured billions and billions and billions of components, billions of sensors and billions of displays. All of these systems are really just rearranged smartphones. It's as if you took the pieces of a smartphone and made them a little bit differently, and all of the modern VR systems only exist because of smartphones, and smartphones only exist because there's a web behind them. So you see how these threads sort of run through? So we have this idea now that we have this incredible capacity. It's in the palm of our hand. We might slap it on our head occasionally. It's going back and forth. So 
we need to start asking ourselves, what are we going to do with it? We know after 20 years that the web is about sharing knowledge. We know that every one of us has more access to knowledge than we have ever had, and we have it more continuously now on any topic we want because we have the web. VR is slightly different. It's that, but in a different key, because virtual reality is really about the sharing of experience. It offers a viscerality. It's still about sharing, though. Note that they're both still about sharing, and that is a key aspect, because everything that we have learned from the web about, to sh about sharing can be imported if we design it well into virtual reality. When we think about how VR systems work, and we need to think about that because we need to be methodical about that, I've come up with a bit of a system that I'm calling sensual computing. We have decisions that we want to make. We need to identify the data that's instrumental in helping us make those decisions. We can then visualize or really sensualize that data because remember, virtual reality is more than about your eyes. It's also about your ears, it's about your hands, and maybe about other senses beyond that. And then it's about interactions and it's about building a feedback between data decisions, visualizations, and interactions, because that feedback is where we learn. It is the point where experience happens. Now, let me give you some examples of how that works in actual practice. There's a wonderful app for the HTC Vive called Soundstage. Now, if any of you are electronic musicians, you know that you can take all sorts of fancy components and you can patch them together. Well, Soundstage does this for you in virtual reality. You can take all of these components and you can patch them together so that you can start with a sound or with a trigger or with a keyboard or with an amplifier and click, 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 click. And these things can get very complicated. So you now start to have a system for simulation that is fully interactive. So there's a one-to-one -one between you doing something in your physical body and noticing that there's an effect associated with it. That is an environment for rapid learning. That is an environment that will help you rapidly evolve some interesting solution to the problem that you're looking for. This is the kind of concept that we need to take and copy wholesale into other kinds of problems. Where we're going, now I don't know if any of you recognize this, that's VisiCalc. VisiCalc is the reason that you know about Apple today. It's the only reason. Because the Apple II didn't have a whole lot of reason until VisiCalc was released. And VisiCalc is the first spreadsheet. And VisiCalc changed the way we thought about computing, and it also changed the way we thought about money and the way we thought about business and everything. We actually live in the age of the spreadsheet. We may not think about it, but so much of our lives is actually formulated about the fact that it is running on a spreadsheet, that we can run the numbers. That's a spreadsheet term. That term doesn't mean anything unless you have a spreadsheet. And so we're about to see this happen again, but in the framework of virtual reality and simulation. So just as the interactive age gave us the spreadsheet, the virtual age is going to give us these wonderful in-depth simulations. That's one view of how the future looks. But if you take a look at that, that really looks an awful lot like a spreadsheet that someone's just sort of spread around themselves inside of virtual reality. There's nothing there that's particularly affecting other than there's a lot of data being displayed, but it sort of looks like it's on a screen. And that tells me that right now, no one knows anything. And it's okay to say that we don't know anything, as long as we're actually willing to admit that no one knows anything. Because where we are now is in a point of time when we can learn rapidly because we have tools available that will help us learn rapidly. We now have the web. Now here's something. Virtual reality is hard. We need to own that. Filmmaking is hard and virtual reality is harder than filmmaking. It's a team process. It requires lots of input. Yes, you can do simple things fairly effectively, but the big productions, the big statements are going to take time and effort and we don't have all of the answers yet. But what we do have now that we didn't have in 1995 is we have each other. We have the five billion people who are on the web 
every day now, and they're all sharing information, and we can make this happen if we make a commitment to learn from each other as we do it. And so that's, I think, the core of what's happening in sensual computing now. It's an opportunity for us to learn about ourselves and to learn from each other about how to present information and knowledge and experience in a way that allows us to be able to make decisions about it. And to bring it full circle, this is a new app you can get for the Vive called Nano One. You remember the nano manipulator? Well, this allows folks to assemble molecules atom by atom, just pulling them out of the periodic table and snapping them together and creating new structures. If I were teaching chemistry today, I'd be throwing kids in this. Tell me what you learned. How did you do? What happened? Because this brings the experiential to something that has been very theoretical. And this is the first of a new class of tools that will essentially be accessible to everyone to help us learn better. So Mark, you may ask, that's all very interesting, but what are you going to do with virtual reality? And remember I said there, there are these threads and they run together and they continue to run together, the web and VR. They're kind of two sides of the same story. And where I'm going with this is going to really tie these threads together. So you may all remember, I don't know if you heard, there was a little mobile game that was released in July. <laughs> Pokemon Go, which became the most rapidly adopted mobile anything in history. And there was a certain weekend in the middle of July and I had a friend visiting from America and wherever we went, because I was showing my friend Sydney, we saw people playing Pokemon Go. It was almost magical because it was sort of like everyone was in this shared universe that wasn't quite the universe we were in. Alongside that, I was very aware that there were reports showing up in the media about people playing Pokemon Go, perhaps in places where they shouldn't be. For instance, Auschwitz, which seems like it's a bit of a problem. And something triggered in the back of my mind. I was like, oh wait, they're actually using space in a way that maybe they shouldn't be because the space is maybe not appropriate, but the space has no way to be able to tell them that it's not appropriate. And that's when I went, wait a minute, I solved this problem 25 years ago. And I did. But 25 years ago, no one could understand why I'd solved that problem. After Pokemon Go, I didn't have to explain to anyone because it was plain why I had solved that problem. So I took all of that work and I dusted it off and I renamed it a little bit because you've got to make everything new and shiny. And I created something called the Mixed Reality Service. It's going to get just a little bit geeky for you folks. There's something on the internet called the domain name service. The domain name service is the thing that turns a name that you type into a browser's navigator window, amazon.com, ozpost.co.com.au, whatever it might be, turns it into a number of a specific machine on the internet. So domain name service turns a name into a number. Mixed reality service does something analogous. It turns coordinates into a URL. So wherever you are in the world, you can interrogate the world to find out what the world wants to say about itself. Now, Google already kind of does that with Google Maps, but that's all the stuff that Google cares about, which is not a bad thing, but it's incomplete. The world has more to say about itself than, say, Google does. And what we need to support all of this is an internet scale protocol that's very easy and very open and very free so that anyone can use it in any way they see fit because they want space to speak for itself. So in October, this was presented to the World Wide Web Consortium as a prototype for a spec. It's currently going through the entire process of discussing and it will be a couple of years before it's official but it's now on the way to being able to be part of the structure of what we need to support a world. Well, let me show you some of the uses. One of the things that you can do with mixed reality service is you can put it into a drone so that a drone knows whether it's okay to fly over your building or not. 
Or maybe it's okay to fly over your building in the daytime, but not in the nighttime. Or perhaps a fireman pops up to a building that's on fire and wants to get the hazmat information for that building. Or perhaps you're in front of a building that's closed and you want to get the directory and it's open hours. Or perhaps you're playing a game and you want to know whether you're allowed to play it here. And on and on and on. Because the world can speak for itself, it can provide that information to you. But here's the thing. We need this now We maybe didn't need it 25 years ago because we have spent the last 25 years building a global information resource. And this is where these threads come back together again because what's going on is the web is enormous, but the web is walled off from the real world. As it turns out, virtual reality and mixed reality provide the key to be able to knit the web and the real world back together again. So the world of 2040, as we go forward, is a world where there isn't a web and a real world. There's an experience, a mixed reality experience of both of them because the world has got the capacity to talk for itself and we have built the tools and the techniques and the technology to be able to put those together seamlessly in a way that makes sense for us at that moment in time. So, Some closing thoughts. Is VR addictive? There is only one possible answer for that. Absolutely. People talk about getting lost inside of tilt brush for hours. Is that addiction? Eh. If people want to run away from reality, we are building the best possible way for them to be able to do it. And we need to be conscious of that. And we need to be conscious of the fact that all of the techniques that we've built into advertising and gaming to hook people along are amplified almost beyond recognition inside of VR. And we have a responsibility to acknowledge that and maybe to design systems that lead away from that. Can VR be liberating? Well. I think the answer there is possibly. You can put yourself in someone else's shoes, but it has been pointed out that that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to make you more empathetic. I think we need to question the axiom that VR is an empathy machine. It is an experience machine. It can be liberation, but that depends more on the person than it does on the technology. Can VR reveal more of the world to us? Can it reveal more of who we are to ourselves? That's up to you folks. This is our world to create and the design decisions that we make today and going forward shape the capacities and the stories that we can tell. One of my favorite authors, China Mayville, recently said, in this time, because let's face it, the world has gotten very weird and more than a little dark, it is up to every one of us to utopia as hard as we can. We need to have a vision, and it's a positive vision for the future, and we need to make that vision happen. That's our job, because that's our legacy that we will leave for the next 25 years. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming along. Scott's not the only one who's been looking forward to this talk. I have been looking forward to giving this talk, and I've been sort of working toward giving this talk over a couple of times over this year. What I want to do is I want to give you a real tour of the past, the present, and the future of virtual reality. And I want to show you how the story of virtual reality is bound up intimately with the other great transformation in technology in our lifetime. And I think that'll become clear 